Uh, also on the platform, of course, we look at the wider issues uh, affecting our society. And one, and I don't know if it's a slow burn, the education system. Um, we spend much in this country, a huge proportion of our um, tax take goes on an education system, which many would have said in years gone by was world class. Um, that gave the majority of young New Zealanders access to a pretty damn good education system, which they took advantage of and resulted in us in having high levels of literacy and numeracy and therefore a highly skilled workforce and highly skilled New Zealanders. And there is no doubt that is a good thing. But for instance, page four of my lovely Dominion Post, nowhere near the cryptic crossword today, this headline on New Zealand, or this story on New Zealand school absentee rates. Children are missing school more in New Zealand uh, compared with other countries, and it is getting worse, a new study has found. The study, and undertaken by the Education Review Office, collected surveys of more than 2,600 students between year and 14 and more than 1,100 parents. It found while COVID-19 had badly disrupted attendance, uh, between 2015 and 2019, the percentage of learners regularly attending school dropped from 70% to 58%, well be, uh, below other international averages. That is just one indicator, international uh, benchmark against which we have fallen. But there are others. And to discuss what they are and what we might do about this, uh, from the New Zealand Initiative, we're joined by Oliver Hartwich. Oliver, lovely uh, to have you back uh, on the platform with us. Thank you. Good morning, Sean. All right. How bad, to your mind, and, and what indicators do you use to reach the conclusion that our state education system is in decline? Well, first of all, the situation is bad. It is a catastrophe. It is a national disgrace. It is a disaster. And we should really declare a state of education emergency for New Zealand because the system is falling apart and has been falling apart over a long period of time. You mentioned that the decline goes back at least 20, maybe 30 years. How do we measure it? Well, how many ways do you want to measure it? You've already mentioned truancy. There's nothing new, by the way, today in the report. We have known that truancy is a massive problem for New Zealand schools. What the report this morning probably didn't give you is the information that this is extremely unevenly distributed. So if you are in decile 1, you are far less likely to attend school than, say, if you're in decile 9 or 10. So this is a phenomenon that really attracts our poorest socioeconomic communities. So that's one way of looking at it. By the way, we've got about 100,000 students in this country that are deemed chronically absent, meaning they miss at least 30% of their school time. And again, totally unevenly distributed. We have about 25% of students in Dessau 1 communities that only attend regularly, meaning more than 90% of the time. So that's one way. The other way is actually looking at numeracy and literacy rates. Now, we've known for a while that there is a problem Back in 2014, the Tertiary Education Commission even told us that they tested school leavers and they wanted to find out how literate and numerate are they really. And mind, mind you, they had NCA level two. Now, you would kind of think, well, if you leave school with a certificate, you must be able to read, write and calculate. Well, not so. What we actually found was that schools never properly assess reading and writing and numeracy. We just infer it. So if you take a course, for example, in history where books are read, hopefully, then you get a numeracy, a literacy credit for that. And conversely, you will get a numeracy credit for anything that involves numbers. But when you actually start testing, you find that about 40% of school leavers, even back then, were functionally illiterate and enumerate, meaning they couldn't function in normal society. The ministry recently tested this. I mean, it only took them eight years to design their own test. <laughs> it was relatively quick for the ministry. Um, what they found was actually that if we applied proper literacy and numeracy standards across the board, we would fail at least two-thirds of a year. Of two course, thirds. No going to do that. At what, 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 thirds. At what age? Uh, at age 15, um, we, yeah. we tested and we found that two thirds wouldn't pass the combined literacy numeracy test. And by the way, again, same picture, you have an extremely uneven distribution. So if you're in Desal 1, guess how much a chance you have to pass the writing test? I don't know, you tell me. 2%. 
Wow. Two percent of students in Dessau one passed the writing test. For Dessau nine and ten, of course, it was way above sixty percent. So again, totally unevenly distributed. Another way of looking at it, PISA. You know, the OECD, the International Organization of Developed Economies, yeah. they are testing the member states on the performance of their education systems. Through a thing we called found PISA. PISA, exactly. Yeah. We found that New Zealand has lost the equivalent of one and a half years worth of maths teaching over the last 20 years. So today's 15-year-olds are only as good as at maths as, as uh, 13 and a half year olds would have been 20 years ago. That's the equivalent of what we lost. We used to be above the OECD average when it comes to science and maths and reading. And today we are on some measures average and on some others below. Okay. So you're telling us despite all the advances in technology, research into teaching and education, the achievement of our children in our state education system is actually either just been static or is literally going backwards? It is more going backwards. I mean, static would be nice, actually. No, we're falling. We are falling far behind the rest of the world. And by the way, despite investing more and more into our education system. So when PISA started in the early 2000s, we actually spent less per student than the OECD average, quite a considerable amount less than the OECD average. Today, we spend slightly more than the OECD average. So you kind of expect our results to improve. In fact, we have fallen behind because of wrong teaching methods, a lousy curriculum, and all the other problems in the education system we can talk about. All right, so how do we fix this? And do we have to admit to the problem before we can fix it, Oliver? We have to admit to the problem. That's how every fix always starts. But fixing it is difficult because sometimes you don't even know where to start anymore because there's hardly a piece in the New Zealand education system that still works. I remember I had a conversation with a very senior former politician and asked for advice on how to fix the education system. And his answer was, give me one and a half tons of TNT and place it under the ministry. <laughs> so I think it was hey, an interesting hey, Hang idea. on, just in case Rebecca Kitteridge is listening, that was a joke. You shouldn't be reporting Oliver as being a violent extremist. Um, you've got to be very careful what you say these days, Oliver. They'll be knocking on your door, mate. Indeed, um, but I was only quoting. It was reported speech and I didn't identify my source. Okay, good. Um, so what I'm, what I'm saying here is we have a problem right at the top. And the problem is quite visible because when you look at the education ministry, I mean, I've been in this country for 10 years now. When I started, the education ministry had about a bit more than 2,000 full-time staff. Today, they are well above 4,000 staff. And these are the people setting the rules. They are designing our curriculum. They are designing our assessment system. And unfortunately, they have led us in the wrong direction. The problem is once you're an organization of more than 4,000 staff, it is very difficult to turn it around. And that's why I mentioned that it would be better sometimes perhaps to start again, have a completely different organization, or at least put it under proper management and proper political control and say, hey, we've been going in the wrong direction under your leadership for the last 30 years. Isn't it time to try something else? So I think these reforms really have to start with an acknowledgement at the top and with reforms at the top. And I think in the current state, our Ministry of Education is simply not fit for purpose. Wow. How well what do you mean when you say that? That's easy to say, not fit for purpose. Has it got a structural problem to it? Has it got a philosophical problem to it, Oliver? Tell us exactly why that. it's not fit. It has a philosophical problem. It has an absolute philosophical problem. It has been going in the direction for decades now of so-called student-led learning, of you know, modern learning environments, of uh, student-led inquiry, of all sorts of other things that sound nice, 21st century skills, you know, creativity and empathy and all of the other things. Unfortunately, oh, we can't have any of that, way. can we, Oliver? People should be well, sitting there learning by rote, you know, and being, being whipped and caned. Oh, now you're actually pulling my leg. No, of course not. Well, no, no, but so what I'm saying is, I mean, we could just basically say they've gone woke, couldn't we? Well, you could say that, but actually um, they started this well before the term woke even became known. The problem is actually all of this stuff, creativity and empathy, and of course all of the other things are wonderful. And diversity and, and inclusion and being rainbow this and rainbow yeah, that. Um, and, and I'm 
No, well, I, I wouldn't mock this too much. I mean, of course, some of this we need. We need some of these skills. The problem is, can you teach them? Or can you actually teach knowledge and then hope that some of these skills like creativity and critical thinking develop later? Mm. I'll give you an example. So I'm a fairly creative kind of guy, even though I'm a German economist by background. Yeah. Um, I'm relatively creative, but I couldn't use this creativity commenting on, say, rugby or cricket because I don't know anything about rugby or cricket. It's my fault. So you put me in a commentator seat and I wouldn't have a chance. Right. Because what I'm lacking here is the knowledge. Yeah. You can only actually use your creative skills, all your critical thinking skills, if you have some knowledge to actually work. Yeah, it. yeah it's a good so point. You give me a problem that you give me a problem that I know where I have some background knowledge and I can be creative. But you cannot teach me creativity in the abstract and then say, hey, can you please comment on a rugby match? I couldn't do that. It's not my job. Mm. It's not my expertise. And it's the same at school. We need to make sure that we give our students a decent education, including very deep knowledge. And then, once they have that, of course they should be creative. Mm. Of course they should think critically. But you cannot teach critical and creative thinking in the abstract. Mm. Also, I guess some would say that this idea that no one should be allowed to fail. Everyone gets a participation badge, don't they? in rugby or soccer or anything else. And it seems to me that not setting a standard, and I know it sounds fuddy-duddy and conservative in the extreme, but not saying you don't pass unless you can do these things um, would seem to me a crazy way to run an education system because when people get out in the real world and they are competing for jobs and competing with each other, achievement, real yeah. achievement does matter and is measured. And it wouldn't just seem crazy to you, it is crazy. We have designed our whole system with the idea that every school leaver will get a certificate. And to that end, we have now designed 9,000 courses under the NCA system, so that's our school assessment system, under which you can uh, collect credit points. And then you have absurd credit standards. You have, for example, courses on how to prepare a microwave dish. You know? No, you don't. No, you're joking. No, we, we do. We do. We have courses under NCA about folding cardboard boxes, preparing microwave dishes, and serving tea. You can trick, collect credits on that. You probably even get some numeracy and literacy credits along the way. This is the way the system is designed. It is not an accident, it is on purpose. The whole purpose is to make sure that everybody gets a certificate. Unfortunately, 40% of school leavers then can't read or write or calculate. 40%. were surprised. 40%. Well, that's the, well, that is the finding of the Tertiary Education Commission. It's a few years old. It's probably worse today, meaning they're functionally illiterate. doesn't mean that they don't understand a few letters here and there are a few words, but functionally illiterate means they couldn't function, for example, in reading a um, kind of times table or actually uh, reading a recipe or writing to um, wow. a company. So that is the level of literacy that 40% of our school leavers do not have. We're not even talking about getting them ready for university and ready to study. We're talking about really basic skills for everyday life. Mm. So you're talking about a reboot of the education system starting at, at the infrastructure or, or the administrative level of the Ministry of Education. Is any political party promising this? Which of our political well, offerings at the election next year, uh, which of our political parties are closest to agreeing with your ideas? Well, let's put it this way. Um, that the system is the way it is, is a function of having had both national and labor governments in the past. They were all um, as bad as each other. They were all working with the same Ministry of Education. And so the fault actually lies with governments from the last 30 years, no matter which color. However, having said that, we are working with the opposition. We're having very good conversations with opposition politicians. And I think slowly but steadily, they are getting it. They are coming our way. And they have accepted many of our recommendations especially on literacy, on phonics teaching. And I think it is necessary because actually this should not be a left or right wing. It is a, just a question of what works. We know exactly what works from international experience in education systems and we really have to fix this because otherwise we are leaving a large part of our population behind. You know, if you are born poor in a poor socioeconomic circumstance, well, unfortunately, the chances of you getting a decent education are very slim and therefore you will likely remain poor for the rest of your life. You will not live to your full potential. Of course, there are always exceptions and that's wonderful. But on average, and I'm speaking in averages here, we are condemned 
condemning people from the bottom of our society to remain where they are because they're not getting the education they need. Schools should be great levelers, and they are not. It also sounds like they should also be places that set more standards than they do. And, and, I, and I don't mean in a negative way, are tougher or demand more from our students and our young people. We should, and we should expect more. We have a culture of a, a soft bigotry of low expectations. So if you're coming from a background that is relatively poor and where your parents didn't have much of an education, we wouldn't expect you to thrive. We wouldn't expect you to learn great things. You're kind of expected to remain where you are. We're never really spelling this out, but that's in practice how the system works. And I come from a different background and I have a different expectation. If I can share my story with mm, you. Yeah, I mean, um, please. You would have never picked this up, of course, for my accent, but I'm German. And um, I come from a background from not such a flesh part of Germany, from an industrial part of Germany, from Essen, the Ruhr, built on coal and steel. My parents didn't go to university. My parents didn't even go to a higher school. My dad was a policeman and my mother was a housewife. And on my dad's side, father was a publican and then a brewery salesman. And on the other side, there was a, my granddad was a, an employee of German Rail. So nothing was, was further from that kind of background than a higher education. And yet my parents sent me to a state school where I learned Latin, where I had fantastic teachers, where a third of my teachers had a PhD, and where I got all the skills I needed in life, where I learned English, more or less. And then I went to university, then I started, I got a master's, I got a PhD, I'm here now. So that's the kind of education background that you should probably consider sometimes. If I didn't have a good school, if I didn't have great teachers, with my background, I would have probably stayed where I was born and I wouldn't have had the kind of career I'm currently having. And you'd be pulling pints saying, or, or, I don't know, delivering mail somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why I'm personally passionate about this, because I think there is so much potential in students, no matter their parents' background, no matter their economic circumstances, we have to discover their talents. And un unless you introduce students to the wonders of this world at school, teach them chemistry, teach them mathematics, introduce them to foreign languages, geography, history. I mean, how could a student know that a student has an interest in history, for example? Well, we have an education system that I'm sorry from the outside. Uh, looks like we've, we spend more time worrying if they're gay or transsexual than whether or not they can read or write. Yeah, yeah, we're focusing on all sorts of side stores when actually what we should be doing is we should be going back to the basics. I mean, this is all very nice to talk about all of these side shows, but if your students leave unable to read, write, calculate, have a basic knowledge of the world, have a basic knowledge of geography, all of this is for nothing. Yeah, can I tell you what? I just want to read something to you because I think your passion and what you're saying this morning is shared, Oliver. Uh, kia ora, Sean. I'm a teacher. I have been bleating on giving the same message as your guest for the past seven years. It is heartbreaking to be striving for student achievement on a daily basis in a low decile school, be constantly encountering the types of problems he describes and not being listened to. It does give me hope for a change listening to this. Thank you. I'm getting back to work uh, now. So that is from someone at the coalface, uh, completely unprompted. Um, I'll be asking actually teachers and those involved uh, about this. Do you feel there is a will from individuals inside the system to implement or to be part of the changes you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. And every time we publish something like this or I have an op-ed in the Herald or we, we go on programs like yours, I get feedback emails from teachers, really people working in the system, sometimes having worked there for decades, and they all tell me, thank God someone finally speaking out because we have to get this on the agenda. I actually think what we should do is something a little bit more formal. Remember, I mean, a couple of years ago, it was kind of ludicrous. A lot of councils around the country, and I think the parliament as well, declared an emergency for climate change. Oh, well, which is completely well, bollocks. From that. Yeah, it's bollocks. Yeah. It was, of course, uh, yeah, because nothing followed. What we should be doing, nevertheless, we should declare a national emergency on education. Because we have not just a crisis, not just a little bit of a problem that requires a bit of a reform. No, we have an absolute education catastrophe, a disaster. And it, it, it takes a declaration 
collaboration of people coming together saying enough is enough we have to change the way our education system is run otherwise we are writing off a whole next generation and you know what the longer this goes on the harder the problem will be to fix because in the future you will not even have teachers anymore who know what a decent school looks like because they've never experienced it themselves um oliver our text machine's blowing up okay with people absolutely ag agreeing with you and can i say something this is really interesting we've had many conversations over the years uh, on a lot of topics. I've never seen you so passionate. I've never seen I'm you so angry. Because I'm angry. Yeah. I yeah. am really angry. I've been here for 10 years now. The one big disappointment about New Zealand coming from overseas. I was in Britain before. I was in Australia before. I come from Germany. I get to New Zealand. I think this is a developed country. It should have a decent education system like all the other countries. And what I find here is a crap education system that doesn't deliver. It's a national disgrace. It is absolutely beyond time, really, to reform this bloody system and get it ready and fit for purpose. And this really irks me. We've done this for 10 years. We have done study after to study. We've demonstrated what we can do. We have done some of the most innovative work you could find in education policy around the world, and it's sitting there. It is waiting for that one reformer to really turn things around. Oliver, I thank you for your passion. I thank you so much for joining us this morning, and I hope this is really just the start of a wider and, and, and bigger conversation. Go and have a cup of tea and a lie down, because I think I've raised thank the blood you. pressure this morning. That is Oliver Hart Hartwich. Uh, researcher, advocate from the New Zealand Initiative. Boy, um, what a great idea. Day, uh, uh, gosh, why have I forgotten his name? David Shaw, head of the Labour Green Party? James, James Shaw. Uh, James Shaw, get on your plane back from the BS COP27 conference and why don't we declare, rather than a climate emergency, which is just a load of political claptrap and waffle because the world isn't burning, but God damn it, our educational achievement for our kids is, I cannot believe that, 50% of school leavers, Oliver estimates, are functionally illiterate. Are functionally illiterate. Enough with the participation awards. Um, let's fix this system. And I would have much more respect for any politician that advocated to declare an education emergency in New Zealand rather than a bloody woke climate change emergency. And what else feeds into this? Oh, our kids are all going on climate marches and got him, the, them, they toilets and stuff. What a load of rubbish. There you go. Uh, there is Oliver's, I think, impassioned plea. I've never seen him like that before. For us to do something about education uh, and boy, a lot of texts on this. Welcome to New Zealand. I've been saying this since Merv Wellington was Minister of Education. The Teachers Union will not allow change, uh, says John. Oliver Hartwich is a legend, says Norrie. Uh, Oliver, wow, says Mike. Um, Sean, the reason Latin is being axed at school in favour is Maori is so the future generations don't get an education that allows them to speak and think like your German guest. He's not German, he's actually a very committed New Zealander now, is Oliver. Uh, boom, that's why my wife is homeschooling our kids. New Zealand's education system is just a low budget and tacky comedy act. Uh, sh uh, morning, Sean, great interview with Oliver Hartwich. He is a very intelligent man, well he's a passionate man too, with great input. So I hope you're able to have him on more often. He's been on many times, uh, Jesse. Love your texts, your thoughts, your calls on this. Important, important uh, issue.